Welcome everyone. My name is Blair Elliott. I am the Communications and Events Associate at the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. We would like to welcome you today to our roundtable discussion on labor and the class idea in the United States and Canada. This discussion will center around Barry Eidlin's book of the same title. Professor Eidlin teaches at the Sociology Department at McGill. His research explores the changing relationship between social mobilization, political processes, and ideology in advanced capitalist democracies. Our three panelists tonight will discuss the book's findings and its key arguments, and Professor Eidlin will give a response following that. We will then have a Q&A moderated by Axel Vandenberg of McGill. Uh, we invite you to use the Q&A box that's found at the bottom of your screen at any point during the discussion to submit your questions, and they will be answered at the end of the discussion. This webinar is being recorded. You'll be able to watch it on our YouTube channel next week, along with all of NIST's other events, both in person from the past and our current webinars. To start us off tonight, I would like to introduce Danielle Benon, who is the director of the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, and James McGill Professor in the Department of Political Science at McGill University. Danielle. Thank you very much, Blair. Bonsoir tout le monde. Welcome everyone to this first MISC event of the 2020-2021 academic year. Uh, this fall, all our events are online using Zoom, a technology that allows us uh, to communicate uh, and to engage with people from coast to coast to coast and beyond. And uh, this is, um, of course, not as good as meeting in person, uh, uh, at least in some circumstances, but uh, we, uh, we think that um, this mode of communication is, uh, is quite effective uh, to uh, keep the dialogue and, and keep the scholarly discussion uh, open despite this uh, global pandemic. And I'm really glad that the first event of the semester is devoted to uh, Barry Adlin's book because uh, Barry uh, is of course a, a faculty member here at McGill, but this is the first event uh, uh, on, at McGill uh, uh, devoted to uh, his, um, his book. And so I'm really glad that MISC is involved, uh, is putting this event together in collaboration with our friends in the Department of Sociology here at McGill. And we have some great guests today. Uh, and our moderator, Axel Vandenberg, will introduce them. But let me say a few words about Axel, who uh, is a professor in the Department of Sociology at McGill. He's a prolific scholar who has published extensively about economic sociology, rational choice theory, welfare states, labor market issues, and sociological theory, among other topics. So we are really glad, Axel, uh, that you accepted to, uh, to moderate uh, this discussion. Merci beaucoup, Axel. It's all yours. Thank you, uh, Danielle, for that over-the-top introduction. Um, I'm much gra very grateful for that. So the way we'll, uh, the, the panel is organized is that the three members, which I will, whom, whom I will introduce in a sec, uh, will speak uh, one after the other uh, for about seven to eight, and in one case, 10 minutes. I'll explain that in a second or two. Uh, and then Barry will answer them. And then the floor will be open to your questions. And you can enter your questions in the question and answer on the question and answer board, which you can access at the bottom of your screen. So uh, as we go, uh, feel free to write down your questions. And then at, after uh, Barry has had his chance to respond to the panelists, I will look at the questions and I will uh, uh, ask Barry to answer those questions. Uh, that uh, I deem to be appropriate. That's my prerogative, apparently, as the moderator of this panel. So without further ado, uh, we have three uh, eminent uh, commentators. Uh, Etienne, and we'll, uh, I will uh, introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Uh, Etienne Quentin is a professor of labor relations and employment relations at the Faculty of Social Sciences at Laval University in Quebec. Shannon Dynan is an assistant professor in politics and international studies at Bishop's University. 
She just started her job there, so we congratulate her. And uh, Xavier La France is a professor in the Department of Political Science at UCAM. And uh, of course, uh, my colleague Barry Eidlin is an assistant professor in the sociology department at McGill. So the way we'll proceed is that Etienne will have the job of, give it, of giving you a sort of a, a brief summary of uh, Barry's argument in the book. And then he will give his comments, criticisms, suggestions, and so on. Uh, he gets 10 minutes for that. After Etienne, Shannon will speak for about seven or eight minutes. And after her, uh, Xavier will speak for us about seven or eight minutes, and then it'll be Barry's turn. Uh, I, haven't, I can't remember how many minutes Barry gets, but uh, they won't be, uh, they'll be limited in some way or, <laughs> or manner. Okay, so I immediately, uh, 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 to give the floor to Etienne, who will give the first uh, 10 minute talk. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this panel. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to read the, the work of Barry Eidlin, who, who has written an ambitious and painstakingly uh, researched book that seeks to explain how and why the fortunes of the labor movements in the US and Canada have diverged beginning in the mid 60s. Uh, in a nutshell, I'm quoting here page uh, 157. The central argument is that understanding US Canada uh, union density divergence in the 60s requires understanding the different processes of political articulation that occurred in the US and Canada in the 30s and 40s uh, as the working class was fully politically incorporated. Incorporation of the working class here does not refer to the moment when workers uh, won the, 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 the right to vote. Um, it, it refers instead to the process whereby workers and their organizations, I'm quoting again, switched from being a problem for the state to address through ad hoc uh, legal and um, uh, uh, police repression to being a constituency uh, for state actors to address and mobilize via formalized channels. And uh, Eidlin uh, documents how in response to the crisis of the Great Depression and World War II, farmer and labor groups were incorporated in different ways in, in uh, each country. Specifically, he argues that the key difference driving uh, divergence in the countries was uh, that US labor was incorporated as an interest group over the course of the 30s and 40s, whereas Canada, Canadian labor was incorporated as a class representative. And these different identities would uh, reflect different organizing logics, uh, basically that enable and constrain labor uh, in different ways in each country. So whereas Canadian labor's role as a class representative uh, fits into a, a class ID, uh, the title of the book, uh, that would have broadened and legitimated uh, 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 its action, US labor's role as an interest group fit into a pluralist ID that narrowed and delegitimized uh, its scope of action. Uh, given the time constraints uh, today, my commentary is going to focus on the second part of the book. Um, it's a mere 99 pages of text. It's, it's tight, it's short, uh, but it presents a really robust narrative and theorization of class politics since the 30s. It is deeply grounded, in, despite its brevity, in two national literatures. It makes it difficult to summarize uh, in such a short time, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll mix my comments here with a, a short short summary. So in Canada, according to uh, Eidlin, there was a coercive response to the upsurge of uh, farmers and workers during the Great Depression, and that left these constituencies available for an independent left coalition. Uh, that, uh, and and uh, this contrasts with the US case to which I'll return in a bit. So um, in, in the Canadian case, the Lyon, Will, William Lyon Mackenzie King government uh, reversed some of Bennett's uh, anti-labor poli policies uh, after returning to office in 35, but it rebuffed calls uh, for a Canadian Wagner Act. Uh, as is well understood, the other works have pointed to, 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 to the, this, these facts. Uh, the King government uh, only acceded to labor's demands for le legal recognition uh, in the mid 40s under the pressure, uh, under the growing electoral threat from the CCF so the, the pressure from the CCF will have forced the, the hands of the liberals uh, to uh, basically adopt 
sort of Wagnerian model uh, slowly, beginning with uh, PC 1003, uh, which remained in force until uh, 48, when uh, uh, the uh, Industrial Relations and Disputes Investigation Act was passed. And that became the basis for the post-war labor regime uh, in Canada. It became also the template for uh, provincial legislation, uh, basically uh, modeled around uh, Wagnerism. Uh, Eidlin makes contrast between the labor regimes in the two countries, and we'll, we'll get back to that, but he, he, he argues that basically in Canada, uh, since uh, organized labor was a class representative, um, it, it became part of a bargaining process to enforce industrial peace, and that left the labor regime more legitimate and stable over time than was the case in the U.S. Um, I, I, I believe that all this uh, part of Barry's argument is uh, really persuasive. I think it, it might need some clarifications or qualifications because uh, it does uh, go against the grain of some research, uh, especially on labor law history in Canada, uh, that documents how basically by 1950, uh, the ideology of, and practice of industrial pluralism uh, had become hegemonic in Canada too. So I'd like to see how Barry uh, situates himself vis-a-vis -vis, uh, some works. I'm thinking especially of uh, the work of professors uh, Fudge and Tucker, I've got the book here, uh, basically that, that argues that the Woods Report uh, to which Barry refers in, in, in his work, um, according to them, it was the expression of a Canadian industrial relations ideology that drew its inspiration from the American model of industrial pluralism. So there, there would be a, a, a major influence here. And uh, according to them, this is really industrial pluralism, the, the kind of regime that becomes dominant in Canada from the 50s. Um, I'll turn to the case of the US here. Uh, Eidlin argues that uh, President uh, Roosevelt uh, basically um, adopted a co-optive response to farmer and labor insurgency. Uh, that co-optive response took the form of policy offerings that uh, absorbed some working class and agrarian factions uh, into uh, basically a liberal democratic party coalition. Uh, I do believe that there's a lot of focus on Roosevelt himself uh, in the book as uh, crafting a co-optive New Deal, and that tends to overlook a bit uh, some contributions of other key participants uh, in the reforms of that period, especially members of Congress such as um, Senator uh, Roosevelt, uh, pardon me, Senator Robert Wagner. Uh, Wagner was, in fact, the key politician be, uh, behind Section 7 a of the NERA and then uh, the 1935 National Labor Relations Act, and uh, I'd like I'd like Barry to to argue, uh, make his case that uh, Wagner's actions in, uh, were themselves co-optive in a way. Um, Co-optation in the uh, Oxford English Dictionary means to absorb into a larger political group, uh, and uh, arguably. Uh, this is not what Wagner himself sought to do when he, he, he presented his bill to Congress. Wagner, uh, the Wagner Act, uh, I don't see as so much as co-optive as stemming from the conclusion drawn uh, by the senator and his allies that collective bargaining as a means of improving wages and, and purchasing power was the, the way out of the depression and that without more effective state action, American employers would continue effectively to resist uh, unionization. So I think be, be, between the argument of a co-optive uh, Roosevelt and the actions of some of the other members of this coalition, there, there, there might be slight uh, nuances to make. Um, Barry's argument in general fits into a very specific spot in, in the historiography of the 30s and 40s. It's different from the liberal conception of industrial union history. This focused on the role of favorable uh, labor le legislation and a sympathetic government in making rapid union growth possible, and also on the conservative reaction to industrial militancy uh, that, sh that curtailed union growth and reform legislation at the end of the, the 30s. There's a contrary view, uh, which I think left its mark on, on Barry's work. Uh, it argues that the New Deal, uh, New Deal legislation, such as the Wagner Act, 
was a reluctant response of the government uh, to farmer and labor militancy. Uh, it depicts the government's action, but also the institutionalization of uh, industrial union impulse uh, in the CIO as a deliberate and effective containment or co-optation of more radical impulses in the labor movements. So this, this fits, this I would call the new left or radical perspective on uh, industrial union history. And um, we can trace it back all the way to C. Wright Mill's work, uh, which is not cited uh, in Barry's argument, in Barry's book, but C. Wright Mill's already uh, argued that there was a partial integration of company and union bureaucracies in administering uh, CIO contracts. Um, there's an argument that Got the government's intrusive labor relations apparatus robbed labor of its uh, radical heritage in the U.S. And uh, Mills cited uh, statistics to the effect that uh, whereas in 1924, 42% of union officers had proclaimed their affiliation to a third party, uh, by 44, 1944, less than 10% of union leaders uh, were affiliated with uh, a third party. So I think there's some material in C. Wright Mills that reinforces actually uh, Eidlin's argument here. Um, in this vein, other scholars have argued that there was a kind of Faustian bargain between labor's new men in power, new men of power, uh, this is Mills' expression, and deeply entrenched corporate, legal, and political establishments. And I think the, 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 there's some echoes of that in uh, Barry's work. Uh, Eidlin argues that while both the CIO and the AFL benefited organiza orga organizationally, pardon me, from uh, the NLRA, the, the uh, Wagner Act crystallized and exacerbated intra-class divisions uh, and undermined the base for an independent left third party in the US. And I think that part of the argument is, is really convincing. Uh, it explains how the Democratic Party, as he puts it, became the only game in town uh, by the late 40s. So I think all of this is, is really strong. Uh, on the other hand, I'd like to point that there's another uh, line of argument that has developed over the year that contrasts with Barry's work. Um, I'd associate that with what Nelson Lichtenstein has called laborite realists uh, or laborite realism. And it's a view that's less interested in radical alternatives to what happened, the might have happens, uh, but uh, focuses instead on basically the constraints under which people like Sidney Ailman, Robert Wagner uh, acted during that period. So from a re more liberate realist perspective, New Dealers such as Wagner and their progressive allies uh, basically uh, dreamt of transforming industrial relations more thoroughly, but basically for a host of institutional, legal, and political forces, uh, they were constrained in, in their ability to do so and defeated uh, ultimately. So um, I'd, I'd like maybe Barry to situate himself again vis-a-vis uh, -vis that more uh, realist laborite uh, literature uh, associated with uh, Dubovsky, Ziger, and now the new Liechtenstein since he published The State of the Union. Um, these works argue basically that there was, and this also appears in Barry's work, that there was a progressive social democratic option on the table in the US, but that it was defeated in the late uh, 40s. Uh, so in this vein, what Barry calls pluralism, as an organizing ID uh, and uh, the liberal hegemony of the Democratic Party would have become possible only once these social democratic forms of corporatism very much present in the ideology of organized labor uh, were defeated. Um, and, and in the defeat of that, that uh, option, social democratic option, uh, scholars have pointed to uh, basically uh, conservative and employer uh, counter mobilization uh, against uh, the rise of uh, the CIO. Uh, as early as, as 1937, there was a sharp downturn and many companies, large and small, uh, revived their anti-union policies uh, and resisted unionization. There was an intense reaction by business and conservative groups against workers' use uh, uses of their newly found power. 
and that coupled with the the, the 37 uh, recession within the depression uh, led to widespread victories of the right uh, in the federal uh, and state elections of 38. Uh, the growth of the CIO was checked from them on and uh, Congress uh, basically uh, refrained uh, thereafter from ad additional labor uh, legislation. There was also Supreme Court rulings that are identified in the book that uh, basically uh, declared the replacement of employees who were engaged in uh, economic strikes um, uh, uh, permissible. Uh, and uh, start also uh, rulings that punish sit-down strikers. So there was really uh, a, a counter, uh, a conservative movement to constrain labor that was really strong even before the Taft-Lightly Act. Um, uh, Idlin explains that the unions became structurally dependent on hostile and unreliable coalition partners within the Democratic Party, especially, quote, the reactionary, reactionary racist Southern Democrats. And I think he, he's, he's, he's bang on there. It, it's, it's a really uh, important part of his argument. The Southern wing of the Democratic Party uh, together with the hostility of white workers in northern cities to racial integration in their neighborhoods, and also longstanding barriers that unions uh, had, had put to hiring and promoting black workers, they all receive good attention in Eidlin's book. So I think his argument is really strong uh, when he, he makes the case that Canadian workers and union, union organizers did not face the same kind of barriers to uh, multiracial organization. And the defeat of the CIO's uh, Operation Dixie campaign really preserved the South in the, the US as a political and economic bulwark against New Deal and labor. And uh, 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 th this needed to be emphasized and it, it is correctly so. Uh, this co conservative coalition was responsible for passage of the Taft-Hartley Act. Uh, and this participated uh, in the long process uh, through which basically uh, a, a social democratic oriented labor movement was transformed into an interest group uh, labor movement. So I think the book really shows well how um, labor was uh, uh, de-radicalized de by its alliance with the Democratic Party de-radicalized by left purges under Taft-Hartley and then McCartism. This is, this is really well explained. And then it became really distant from the new left social movements because of its uh, 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 basically uh, adherence to uh, foreign policy, uh, the, the Democrats' foreign policy. Um, so this contrasts again with, with the Canadian case uh, in as much as the presence of the CCF and the NDP as a class-based political party uh, would have uh, maintained a stronger link uh, between the left and the working class. I find all of this part of the argument really convincing. Um, it, it, something that could be clarified or, 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 or um, uh, discussed a bit later is how the presence of the CCF and the NDP uh, explains why uh, employer counter uh, mobilization in, in the US was stronger than in Canada. Uh, John Goddard has argued that there is no equivalent campaign in, in Canada uh, to that led by employers to portray labor unions as corrupt, undemocratic, and uh, unduly powerful. Uh, the, the, this has been well documented in, in recent literature. So there's no equivalent campaign in Canada, and uh, this is so even though uh, the, the Canadian labor movement was still dominated by union-based, uh, US-based international unions, and some of the same uh, red-baiting tactics were employed here, but there was nothing on the scale of the, the, the attacks from the right on organized labor uh, in Canada. Um, Eidlin argues that employers in Canada and the US have been unified in their staunch opposition to unions, but I would argue that there's no Canadian equivalent to what Sanford Jacobi has called uh, vanguard welfare capitalism. I've, 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 I've researched a bit and I've tried to find examples of welfare capitalism. There, there are some in uh, the petroleum industry in the 20s and all, et cetera, but nothing on the scale of the, the campaign led by employers in the US, especially large corporations, uh, to create an alternative to unionism. Um, 
uh, that was based on human resource management, company unions, works councils, and benefits for long-term workers. Uh, so uh, uh, I wonder if in his research he's found uh, evidence of, of uh, welfare capitalism in Canada or, or something equivalent. Uh, that, all that being said, I think Eidlin is really right to argue that a pluralist framing of uh, labor relations can lead to a form of interest group politics and downplay, I'm quoting his page 13, the state's role in regulating labor capital relations and buttressing labor's institutional uh, legitimacy. Um, where I'm less convinced is when he argues that the defeat of labor law reform over the long run um, uh, is, can be explained by the fact that uh, state actors interpreted uh, the crisis of the 60s and 70s in terms of individual alienation. Uh, a counterfactual here that I would raise is that uh, rising labor militancy during the long 70s, as it's called, zero, okay, I'm, 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 I'll, I'll end there. Um, rising labor militancy in the 60s was interpreted by many democratic po politicians, such as Robert Wagner Jr., mayor of New York, or Wisconsin's governor, uh, Galen Nelson, as legitimating uh, reforms that would liberalize the public sector labor laws and give more role to collective bargaining and unions. And, and, and this is all quite far from an interpretation in terms of individual alienation. So my point is that rising labor militancy was interpreted by some politicians, industrial relations experts and judges uh, in different terms than individual alienation. So I'd like to, to, to hear what he has to say about this. Um, I had other comments I, I, I'll be able to uh, uh, bring forward a bit later, but I think um, overall, uh, despite the strength of the book, labor's decline cannot be pinned on a single factor. Uh, there's no uh, silver bullet, bullet, to put it this way. And uh, Dorothy Sue Cobble in, his, in her work said, uh, there's no civil bullet in explaining the decline of labor. And uh, she, uh, I quote her, the sooner we stop looking for, work, for, for one silver bullet, the better our analysis of the problem will be. So while I think Eidlin's work really uh, 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 Yera establishes a hierarchy of factors and explains the very important uh, political factors behind a union decline, faster union, union decline in the US, we still need to take other factors into consideration, such as uh, strong and concerted uh, employer resistance. I'll thank you. There. Thank you, Etienne. That was about 22 minutes instead of 10. <laughs> but we have the benefit of having had a very thorough summary uh, of the book so that uh, all of us uh, are uh, even uh, more clearly on the same page in terms of uh, what Barry says and what Barry doesn't say. So now it's uh, Shannon's turn. Um, luckily, we started relatively early compared to uh, the schedule that we had in mind, so we're not really in time trouble yet, but let's hope that we can keep to seven or eight minutes. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure to keep within my time. So thank you very much for having me this evening. Uh, I just want to start out by saying that um, I thought this was a fantastic and particularly well-written book. Uh, so for some of you, you might believe a book on labor relations uh, can be pretty dry. I just want to say that Professor Eidlin's done an excellent job of making it engaging. Um, he's also provided lots of supporting evidence to his argument. So thank you very much for that. It was really a pleasure. Um, so Etienne's done a great job already of going over, uh, you know, the finer points of the argument. Um, I'll just say that Professor Eidlin poses the question, well, what explains why unions are weaker in the United States than in Canada? So whereas um, others may use institutional, national, cultural, or union characteristics to explain these di this divergence, um, Eidlin argues that these explanations basically don't help us understand why the US, US and Canada initially had uh, union density similarities, and then we find the, diver the divergence begins at a specific point in time around the 1960s onwards. So his main argument that partisan art articulations, so basically how 
uh, how did ruling parties respond to the efforts for union uh, unionization back in the 30s and 40s? This will shape, or this did shape um, subsequent interactions. So in one country, we have framing of the issue, uh, which ultimately becomes one of a class struggle. And then the other, um, we see that these issues are framed as special interests. And so this has led to more and more hostility towards unions in the United States. Um, and is, uh, according to his argument, of course, in a nutshell here, um, the main driver for union weakness from the 1960s onwards. So I have to say as well, I very much appreciate how you uh, you take the time to systematically evaluate these competing explanations and you uh, devote entire chapters to explain what they do and don't explain. So as Etienne mentioned, the heart of your argument is succinct, it's 99 pages, uh, but the over, I think something that makes it so strong is that the overall book takes the time to uh, engage with these competing explanations and really devotes time to considering them thoroughly. So in this way, and I hope I'm not mischaracterizing your argument here, um, you definitely have a distinct argument, um, but you also leave room for other theories, or uh, that's how I saw it as a reader, um, and you allow the reader to understand the ways in which they are complementary and not, and so they're not always competing. Sometimes they do offer a further explanation or nuance that can be really important when you're comparing these two cases. Uh, so in my opinion, this provides a much deeper and richer explanation of, of both cases and is really useful because it makes it more obvious how these arguments could be applied elsewhere or not. Um, so that being said, I do have a number of questions for you. Um, so Etienne has done, uh, he's focused on the historical perspective and I'm going to try and focus uh, more a little bit onwards. Um, so two will pertain to your overall argument and then two are more on contemporary, contemporary issues that I'd really appreciate if you address to kind of give us a sense of what we should expect moving forward with these two countries. Um, so first, I'd really appreciate it if you could address the federal nature of these countries a little more. So in the book, you spend a lot of time on the American cultural argument. Um, you also take the time to explain national divergences within each country. So there's definitely data and indicators on this in the book. Uh, you're obviously quite aware of federal dynamics and how the Canadian Federation leaves much more room to the provinces on this issue. So uh, I think in, in one of the passages in your book, you say that while you include this variation, you do not explore it exhaustively. So my question is, to what extent is this uh, important, right? So if you consider, for example, the party system within the provinces as well, uh, they don't necessarily reflect the party system uh, we find at the federal level, right? So you're not always gonna find an equivalence for each party and not because they share the same party name that you're gonna find the same internal dynamics. So basically what I'd like to know is if you could more fully address this aspect of the institutional argument which you, uh, to some point cast aside. Um, I'd just like to know if it's a somewhat of a blind spot or if there's something you'd like to add to that. Um, a second related question is, uh, does the class idea still truly hold in Canada, right? So you partially address this in your conclusion, uh, but I'd still like you to elaborate a little bit more on what this means for the Canadian case. So, um, you know, you convincingly argue how uh, the NDP was created as a labor-based party. It's got the heritage with the CCF. Um, but I can't help wonder if this party truly uh, represents class issues this way in contemporary Canadian politics and what this means. So is it really a working class party? When did this shift occur? Um, or has it, you know, evolved in something else, a party vying for a different set of electors? Um, so this could, of course, lead to similar downtown turn in union density in Canada, or would you argue that, you know, no path dependence has taken hold in this case and there should be a certain stability and we should continue to see divergence between these two cases. Um, finally, my last two questions are on more contemporary issues. Um, so first, just for students and scholars of labor issues, could you just please elaborate on why should we care about this divergence, right? So you're telling us something happened in the 30s and 40s, we've seen a change from the 60s, and basically, you know, for the students in this room, why does this matter? So in your book, you do explain that um, union density has lasting implications for inequality or equality. Um, however, a lot of what's explained, especially wage inequality, applies to male workers. So could you, expect, uh, could you explain what the effects of union density um, mean for other workers? So I'm specifically thinking of young workers, female workers, minorities, and just generally how the structure of work is evolving in our societies. I'd be really interested uh, on hearing about that. And then finally, um, your argument essentially evokes the idea that, you know, a decision made to respond to political struggles when both of these countries, their democracies weren't nascent, but they were truly forming in the ways that we know them today. Um, it's led to a certain path dependence with 
one country um, articulating labor issues with the notion of class country uh, class conflict so that'd be Canada and then the other uh, articulates them as special interest conflicts right so to simplify we have a critical juncture during which the decisions made lead to a path de dependent or a self-reinforcing uh, situation so my question is could we be heading to a new critical juncture? So I've already discussed, you know, maybe changes in uh, the way political parties function in Canada and the working, you know, how working class vote is incorporated. Um, but one reason I ask is that this year, uh, especially this summer, we've, uh, we've seen evidence of how American workers can try to use their clout to change their employer's behavior. Um, so uh, two of the most media uh, mediatized examples are this are how college athletes uh, are not allowed to uh, accept lucrative sponsorship deals uh, they're also uh, not paid wages uh, equivalent to their work and so some players have made demands to unionize uh, within the ncaa uh, and i'm also thinking about professional leagues uh, so like you know the N the nfl the nba mlb and then various soccer leagues uh, who have used their positions to make political statements and they've also made safety demands during the pandemic so we have a set of workers issues uh, and they've been simmering for some time, but all of a sudden now they're bubbling to the surface, uh, which has maybe been accelerated, but uh, happening before because of the health and economic crisis. So my question is, um, does this appear to create or create the potential for a new articulation, which could affect how other workers are politically or incorporated or not in the United States? Or does it actually only, um, unfortunately, serve to reinforce the special interest status uh, of these issues within this country? Because these, these sets of workers uh, tend to have specific employment situations. And so maybe the class conflict won't be so obvious in that case. So thank you very much for my time. Uh, thank you very much, Shannon. You are exactly on eight minutes, <laughs> uh, which means that we have exactly eight minutes left for Xavier, and then we'll be exactly on schedule according to our agenda. So Xavier, go ahead. All right, I'll do my very best. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, and thank you to Barry for writing this great book. Uh, I'll, I'll raise two questions really to be sure to uh, stick with time, remaining time here. Um, Barry's book is very important. It's a great contribution. It shows and it explains how distinct levels of union density in the US and Canada and also evolutions of labor movements in both countries do not stem from essential original differences between these movements at their inceptions, but are rather the result uh, they're the result of political divergences, recent political divergences. So Barry demolishes, demolishes I think, existing explanations of this their divergence, uh, whether in terms of national identity or economic structures. And he uses this model, which he calls, following uh, scholars like Cédric de Leon, political articulation model, to show that the way in which labor movements were politically incorporated uh, deferred in both countries during the 1930s and 1940s, with the movement being co-opted, as was said by my colleagues before, uh, as part of a New Deal Democratic Party coalition in the US, whereas in Canada, you have a movement facing coercive responses from the ruling parties, both ruling parties, which led to the creation of the CCF and later the, the NDP. So the result was this kind of path dependency that just uh, was just addressed by Shannon, where you have uh, in the US uh, incorporation of labor as a special interest, as was mentioned. In Canada, you have uh, the class idea, which is institutionally embedded, but also in policies and politics. Now, you have this path, this path dependency, but you also have you know, alliances and balance of power and agency uh, being active later on in the post-war period, as Barry shows, and then in the 60s and 70s, and up to that day, uh, that reproduces actually this divergence. divergence. Um, and you, sh you see that first with you know, anti-communist purges and repression within labor movements uh, being much more intense and destructive in the US compared with Canada. Secondly, you have the emerging new left uh, which is much less connected with labor in the former country in the U.S. Uh, than in the latter in Canada, uh, where you have a renewed left that will incubate, incubate, as Barry shows, within and around the NDP. And thirdly, 
uh, you have an emerging nationalism, and I'm going really schematically here. Uh, it's addressing rich details in the book. Emerging nationalism, as well as public sector workers' struggles to gain union rights and recognition from the 1960s, which had much more positive and positive and lasting impact in Canada than you had in the case of labor U.S. movement. So the upshot of all this, as Barry shows, is that whereas you have the erosion of labor regime that accelerated in the U.S. Uh, it remained stable. It was actually consolidated in Canada during the 70s and even into the early 1980s. And this explains then the diverging union density in both countries. So I think that this argument by Barry uh, is very important, not simply because it he undermines prevailing explanations of the faith of US and Canadian labor movements, but also and especially actually because he shows very well, I think, that this diver, uh, diver, this divergence, sorry, is nothing natural, it's not related to some kind of uh, essential and different national political cultures, but related to politics, that is union, social movements, but also party politics, and that's crucial. Uh, put another way, whereas labor movements face structural constraints and the power of capital in both countries, they fare differently because of political agency, strategy, and alliances. So even though Barry says in the preface, I think he says that, you know, it's mostly an academic work and a great academic book, for sure. Uh, it has, as he very well know, uh, knows, I think, also important strategic implications. I will make a comment related to these strategic implications to conclude my intervention in a minute. Uh, but first I wanna have, uh, I wanna raise a question that has to do with the substantive rich analysis that Barry develops in the second part of the book. Uh, there, Barry explains um, the presence of a left party tied with union, uh, which was, so to speak, a game changer in Canada, at least compared to the U.S., and how this, crucial, this is crucial to understand the institutionalization of the class idea in this country. But as we know, uh, in many ways, it's in Quebec where we find arguably the strongest labor regime and also certainly the highest union density in North America, at least in the US and Canada. Yet we also know that uh, it is also in this province of Quebec where the NDP remained, as you mentioned in the book, all but absent until fairly recently and where there never was actually a provincial labor party with real mass appeal before the formation of Quebec Solidaire in 2006, so fairly recently. Now, one could argue that the Parti Québécois acted as a substitute to a proper labor party in Quebec, uh, but it was only founded in 1968, so much later than the CCF was founded even uh, after the creation of the NDP in 61. And, and also the Parti Québécois actually adopted quite aggressive anti-labor stance uh, after both referendum defeats uh, in the early 1980s and the second half of the 90s. So how then would you explain this apparent divergent case using the political articulation framework? Uh, to be clear, I don't think that this invalidates your old argument at all, but I think it actually points toward, towards important uh, further research maybe, but I'd like to hear you on this. Uh, so I'm gonna conclude with my strategic uh, question or point here. So Barry, in the, in the introduction you use uh, Afes and Weisenstahl's important article in Two Logics of Collective Action. So these authors uh, really schematically explain how labor movements gain institutional, they gain institutional recognition through mass and often uh, quite disruptive mobilization, and then come to lean later on on institutional recognition, which then tends to erode their connection to their mass base, which created this uh, institutional recognition and support in the first place. And this in turn eventually tends to make them quite vulnerable to attacks that will erode their existing institutional support. So I'm gonna uh, quote you on page 236, you say, I quote, unlike in the United States where absorption into the New Deal coalition gave labor leaders an alternate base for leg or of legitimacy, Canadian labor leaders legitimacy uh, remained based largely upon more membership support. So, unquote, uh, it seems to me that the class idea, that, to use your phrase, was not just formally in place, but actually working and making a difference for unions and workers in Canada 
uh, up until the 1970s because they were also mobilizing from below. They were not just being recognized from above, right? And it seems to me that even in Quebec, actually, today, where you have the IS, again, union density in the country at about 30%, uh, unions are leaning much more on institu institutional recognition from above than on mobilization from below. And that doesn't seem to bring the same results anymore as before, as you know, was the case in the 60s and 70s, as you, again, explain in the book. Uh, now, in the US, as you also show and explain in the book, you basically have neither at this point in time. No actually working, actually really working labor regime. It's basically an empty shell, right? Uh, to a large extent, as you argue. And also you have no mass collective action. It's, you know, it's really, really low, historically low. And it's been the case for decades now. So it seems that both movements in Canada and in the US are at different points in the cycle described by Ofe and Weisenthal. And so my question is, what are the strategic implications of this? Put another way, how can these two different national movements capitalize on institutional recognition and representation, both in terms of policies and politics on the one end, and then a mass mobilized basis on the other? Maybe most importantly, how should these two elements be mixed together, uh, according to you, uh, if we are to renew these union movements in both the US and Canada? So I'll stop there. Thanks very much, uh, Xavier. Um, we're pretty close to on time, according to our schedule. So Barry has about 10 minutes to respond to your questions. And then uh, I'll throw the floor open to questions arising on the question and answer board. Uh, I haven't seen any yet. So I invite the, the audience to um, put their questions there so I can uh, um, raise them after Barry is done with his first reply. Here goes Barry. Great, thanks so much. Uh, merci à tous et à toutes d'être venus aujourd'hui. Ça me fait très grand plaisir de pouvoir uh, discuter de mon livre uh, ici à McGill, même si moi je suis à Los Angeles. Uh, I just want to say it's great to be able to finally be able to discuss uh, my book, which now came out two years ago uh, here at McGill, uh, even though I'm personally right now speaking to you from uh, Los Angeles in the midst of the pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was on parental leave and then there was the pandemic and anyway, so anyway, uh, we're here and I'm really excited that there's so many uh, people tuning into this, uh, both on Zoom and on Facebook Live. And I'm really so thankful for the, this generous and uh, really searching uh, feedback on, on the book. I have to say that it, it's, it's a particular treat to hear from my Canadian colleagues um, because they actually can get into the meat of the Canadian case. Uh, you know, when, when I, I often present, end up presenting to these American audiences and, and, uh, and so I'm basically just, they're just prepared to believe whatever I tell them about Canada. So I could talk about, you know, the, the critical role of the alien invasion of 1953 in explaining unit density divergence and they'd sort of just nod and, and that would be fine. Um, but it's great to have these scholars who really know their stuff when it comes to the Canadian case and the Quebec case in particular that we ever heard from Zaji. Um, so I'll just go, I mean, you raised a lot of really important issues and, and I think, and, and, and it's telling um, that the, the, the things that, that you zoomed in on are, are the, the, the specific areas where, where I really had to struggle um, you know, with, 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 with the argument and with, with the research. And, um, and, and, uh, and so there is a tension there. And, and, and so it's not surprising to me that, that these are the places that you would sort of uh, focus in on. So um, let's first start with this idea of, of um, going back to Etienne and, and, and this talk about sort of the pluralist idea that I talk about in the book versus the, the Fudge and Tucker idea of industrial pluralism, which you also see in, in, in a bunch of other literatures, a, a bunch of other scholars in the Canadian industrial relations uh, literature. And um, there, there's two responses. To that. First of all, there, there, one, one thing that's critical to understand throughout the book is that it is a relative comparison so I think for Canadians, you know, we are always intensely aware of 
the weaknesses and shortcomings of our labor movement. And, 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 and so when I talk about, you know, Canada, you know, all these reasons why Canada ends up better than the U S like the, 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 the gut response is like, but you know, Canada has all these problems. Like you need to acknowledge that. And it's like, yeah, but they're still doing better than the U S you know? And so, so, so the pluralist dimension has to be understood in a comparative context. That's the first step. So it's not that it's, completely absent in the Canadian case um, that, that, you know, Canada does have some of that sort of pluralist liberal tradition that, 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 that I'm not, I'm not dismissing out of hand, but I also think there's somewhat of a, just a terminological difference, right? In that what, do, what, when Fudge and Tucker and others are talking about industrial pluralism, they're talking about sort of a set of institutions and practices that really conform to what I would say is the class idea, sort of this institutionalized tripartism and sort of these institutional recognitions of class divisions, um, you know, as opposed to the, the, the pluralist idea that I'm talking about when I talk about the pluralist idea in the book as it's embodied in, the, in, in, in US uh, policy, jurisprudence, practice, and so on. Um, really just sort of views class as just one amongst many different types of cross-cutting identities um, and it doesn't have any sort of special salience whereas i believe that built into the industrial pluralist vision that is in, embodied in the woods report um, you know that, that 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 class is recognized and built into that so so i think that that, that that's important to to, to keep on to keep focused on. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the laborite realism, um, you know, I, I, I certainly go part of the way with that school of thought, certainly with Lichtenstein, who is incredibly influential in my own, in my own thinking about this, um, in that, you know, I, I, I am loath to, I think we need to understand and appreciate the real tension here uh, that the actors at the time were under in the sense that, that when you're in the 1930s, the Wagner Act is a really good deal, right? For, for, for work, if, if you've been, if, if you're part of this labor movement that has been taking it on the chin for 50 years, having the National Guard, you know, put down your picket lines at bayonet point and, you know, having company spies and all that stuff, you know, like having this institutionalized set of rules, uh, is a legitimately good thing, you know, and 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 so we we can't sort of, I I I I really bristle at these kind of readings of the sort of co-optation of labor of the of the period that view it as sort of like this selling out by the bureaucracy or something like that. We have to understand like no, there are actually some really good reasons that they went down that path, even though in the long term it set the stage for labor's long term. Um, Weakness. So I think that, that that I agree with the labor right realism. I just think that we also need to we need to acknowledge at the same time that these very decisions did contribute to that decline and weakness. Um, you very rightly point out this different um, difference in employer pushback in the U.S. and 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 it's it's a it's a theme that Sandy Jacoby and many others have have have, have focused on when talking about the U.S. Uh, weakness of the U.S. labor movement, and you know, I and and while I I try to um, I try to I, I try in the book to disabuse the reader of these notions of Canada as the sort of kinder, gentler place when it comes to industrial relations, and really sort of emphasize that you know there is some pretty vicious employer hostility in in Canada, as I'm sure you're aware, Tim. But I, I would, I would probably, I would agree with you that I think that 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 there isn't that same level of vitriol. The question is why, and I think that that, that when in in terms of my research, what I found is that it's really much more a, a, a the, the the employer behavior. It's not that it doesn't matter. It's that I feel that it. I, I came to the conclusion that it's much more derivative of the institutional constraints that they're facing. Right, and so in the Canadian context, you know, you look at the archives in the post-war period, and they're in lockstep with the National Association of Manufacturers in the U.S. You know, they're they're advocating right to work. They're advocating, you know, like 
you know, okay, the war's over, it's time for us to crack down on, on these workers who've been getting too uppity, all that stuff. I mean, that's all there. The difference is that by that time, the industrial relations situation has gotten so volatile in Canada and the, the government's response like, okay, we've tried everything. We just need to keep a lid on this. And what that means is that they're also much more willing to restrain employers, right? And so, so you have these discussions, uh, you know, in the Canadian Associ Canadian Manufacturers Association with their lobbyists and stuff like that. And it's really interesting to track over time because, you know, they start off in the immediate post-war periods are really gung ho. And then, you know, within about 10 years, they're sort of, they, they've basically given up. They're basically like, well, you know, we're, we're, we're still proposing right to work, but, you know, we all know that it's not going anywhere, whatever. Um, and meanwhile, the state uh, actors are talking about, you know, like, you know, we, we, we don't need Taft-Hartley in Canada because we, we struck the right balance, meaning that they are much more willing to restrain vicious employer behavior than the U.S. Uh, was. Um, and um, I'm going to skip over a few things because there's some important issues that the other speakers got to. Um, Shannon, really, uh, I'm really glad you brought up federalism uh, because this is a really critical thing, and it's not something that I explore in depth in the book. It's something I've been actually toying. toying uh, I, that, that there's there's a, an article in there that I need to talk about because the fascinating thing in this case when we talk about federalism is the fact that it, by a lot by many standards. Well, certainly when you talk about industrial relations schemes, they're much more federalized in Canada than they are in the US. But you have much more, but despite the federalized nature and much more sort of the, the much, much more federalized nature of the industrial relations system in Canada, you have a much greater degree of coherence of industrial relations systems in Canada compared to the US, you know, particularly with regard, you know, which is a federal industrial relations system. Um, and so, so there, there's a really interesting puzzle there of why you get a more internally coherent but more institutionally diffuse structure in Canada compared to the U.S. I haven't really figured out the right right answer for that. Um, obviously, um, you know the role of the South and why you get the South able to impose its 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 uh, desires on the New Deal coalition. Is a, is a key part of that because that's what what that's one of the key driving forces in the pass of the Taft Hartley Act in 1947, which is what allows for some of the interstate variation, particularly with regard to right to work laws. Um, and I think um, you know why this this question of why divergence matters is 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 also a really critical question that that I'm really glad you raised because you're right that. That stuff about unions and inequality does really focus on on male workers, uh, because the I mean, because with with female workers you have the sort of uh, you have the 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 uh, sort of overlay of increasing female labor force participation and you know, sort of increasing attention to gender rights. So even even though um, unions are declining, they're just earning more because there are more of them in the labor force, and there's you know anti discrimination. Uh, laws that are kicking in and stuff that you know still haven't gone anywhere near as far as they need to go, of course, but um, certainly between the 1960s and today are are are, are have made some some, some progress. Um, but why? So why does this union density divergence matter for more mar what we can call for broadly more marginalized communities for women, for people of color, for younger workers? And you know, basically, there's a lot of research that shows that you know that that, that where unions are stronger. Um, there's a great paper by uh, by Jake Grimbach and Paul Farmer that just came out that, that shows that you know higher union density sort of decreases uh, you know racism in white workers. Uh, you know, essentially, um, you know, and 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 unions have a, a a way of of really shoring up the bottom. Really, it's really particularly the more marginalized communities that benefit from from unions. That's not to say that 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 white uh, workers and more skilled workers don't benefit, but that 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 it really shores up the bottom of the labor market. Um, in an important way. So, so 
even though the the economic measures of inequality might be focused particularly on that on a subset of male inequality, uh, wage, wage inequality, um, there's a much broader literature that sort of focuses on the role of unions in you know fighting racism, fighting you know gender, fighting for gender equality, fighting for younger workers, that 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 kind of stuff. Very uneven, of course. You know, we know, we I, I, we need to appreciate the complexity there, um, but um, but but it is um, an important thing to keep in mind. So when you when you take that institutional voice away, when it is weakened, that's bad news for those groups of workers. Um, and uh, so there's one last question from Shannon that, that uh, ties in with Xavier's last question, but I think I, I need to jump to, to Xavier's thing about Quebec labor politics, which is really fascinating. And, and I don't give it, I don't do it anywhere near justice in, in, in the book. Um, and I just, you know, it, it was just too, too hard to, to get into. And, um, you know, I think that, that the, the, the key thing in the, the, the Quebec context ties back to what I do talk about in the book, which is the differing roles of national, nationalism and national struggles in uh, the U.S. and Canada, and, and also between English and, and English Canada and Quebec. Um, and the 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 fact in in Canada that you have this in Quebec that you have this class divide overlaid on a national divide uh, really um, you know means that even though you might not get a labor party in the traditional sense, you get uh, a lot of those sort of class type legislation and and a, a class rhetoric out of the nationalist movement. Um, and and so that that's a that that's a particularly important factor there that you need to to take into account. Of course, as you very rightly point out, you know the 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 that that class and national cleavage overlap is sort of slips over time. Um, you know, certainly by the time you get to the '90s and Parizeau and and and, and Lucien Bouchard and stuff like that. Um, I have a, another paper I'm, I've been working on with uh, with a, a student at UCAM actually uh, that 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 is sort of about specific about this this period in the 1990s where it's sort of this interesting thing where you have this uh, you know turn to austerity on the part of the PQ in the aftermath of the referendum, but you have this expansion of certain welfare state policies at the very same time that everyone else is going towards neoliberal retrenchment. Um, but that's a bit of a that's a bit of a, uh, a uh, side, side issue. I want to finish on this, on, on this strategic question about new critical junctures. Um, does the class idea require, you know, like, does the class idea still hold? And because what we've seen, in, particularly in the past couple of years, has been a really fascinating reversal in some senses, where to the extent that you, that, that, that you have, on the one hand, this, um, you know, like everywhere, you know, the NDP has drifted to the right. Um, Canadian labor, while it has, you know, it 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 did, um, you know, win these gains in the 1970s that sort of reconfigured institutions in a certain fashion that protected labor more, um, but has basically, you know, not, I mean, I, I, it's it's overly simplistic, but has basically been coasting on those victories for the past 40 years. Um, and and meanwhile, has 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 its its organizational infrastructure has weakened considerably. Meanwhile, you've had a, a very a, a complete hollowing out of labor's sort of uh, you know mobilizational infrastructure in the U.S. But yet, in the past couple of years, we've had this massive upsurge. You know, so starting in 2018, with the, well, I mean, you can trace it back to 2012 with the Chicago teacher strike, but especially when you get to 2018 with the Red State Revolt. Um, you know, and, and, and strike levels have, have remained high for the past three years now, um, you know, back to levels not seen since the, uh, since the early 80s. Um, and then obviously in terms of class politics, you know, the, the Bernie Sanders campaign, um, which is the, you know, the, the sort of previously unimaginable uh, insertion of a very, uh, you know, you know, straightforward 
almost one, some might say strident uh, class politics um, in the US political realm, which really challenges a lot of our notions about what is and is not possible in the US political realm. And so the re so, so it's a really interesting question. And then, and then now with, you know, with the response to, to COVID, you know, like you've seen in the US these, uh, you know, I mean, it's not just the pro athletes, like there've been a lot of these essential worker job actions of various types um, where, where people are just walking off the job. Um, and and uh, in, in a way that you have not seen in Canada. And so, so it really does raise the issue of like, to what extent does the class idea still hold? Um, and I don't really have a good answer. I think it's too early to tell right now. Um, but I think that, but, but I think that the, the, the framework still provides an, a, a useful framework for thinking about these current manifestations. So I, I, I've gone on probably over time, but I, I, I'd like to really hear what the, uh, what the audience has to say. And thanks again for this really, uh, really uh, generous um, feedback. Yes, you have gone over time, Barry. <laughs> uh, we are now a little bit behind schedule. We have about 15 minutes left uh, according to our agenda. We're supposed to close at 6.50, which is uh, about 15 minutes from now. Um, I have one question from the audience so far, so if there aren't any other ones uh, popping up, then I'll, I'll ask a, a couple of questions myself and I'll ask the panelists to respond to your response. Uh, the question is, uh, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on the current modern contest, uh, context. How is worker mobilization and unionization affected by the digitalization of the workforce and the resulting transformation of work? as in the gig economy. Do you have a, a response to that, Barry? Yeah, no, that's, that, that, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I, I think it's really important. I think that there's obviously a lot, I mean, when, when we talk about the future of work, it's all, always the stuff about digitization of work in the gig economy. Uh, and I think it, it, here is where keeping things in historical perspective is really useful because, um, you know, uh, you know, actual like the, the the actual the change is actually not nearly as great as previous changes we've seen in the automation of the workforce and changes in industrial relations. Um, you know, when you compare you know the gig economy and stuff like that to the invention of the of the um, you know production line or something of the assembly line or something like that. Um, so and 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 actual worker productivity has 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 been declining, if anything, in recent years. So so there, there there's a certain degree to which I think this is really overhyped, and then there's another degree to which it's actually sort of a rehearsal of a lot of the same issues. It's a different manifestation, it's a new manifestation of the same issues that workers' movements have always faced. Number one of which. Is that is that that perennial question um, best posed by, by by Tony Danza in the '80s sitcom of who's the boss, um, right? That um, that one of the key ways that management has exerted its power is by hiding, um, whether it's behind you know whether it's in the world of cottage industry back in the 18th century or piece rates um, or subcontracting. Um, and 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 all these different types of arrangements, and the gig economy is is just the latest version of that, right? So so there's there's this constant give and take in 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 industrial relations history of employers figuring out ways to basically uh, shrink out of the field of vision, right? And so so that so that it's hard to discern who is actually the power against which you can air your grievances, and workers organize against that. And a lot of what a lot of what a lot of the work of worker mobilizing. I mean, we think about sort of these strikes, and we think about you know picket lines and all that stuff. But a lot of the work that 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 workers' movements are doing is precisely creating the employer, right? Is creating the opponent against which you can push back. Um, and and so I think that that what we have now today in terms of responding to the gig economy is 
a series of efforts to create the boss in a way, in, in a way that, that, that pulling them out of the shadows so that you can actually fight them. Uh, and, 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 and you see that with, I mean, here in California, there's a big fight going on now where the legislature, legislature uh, just passed a law called AB5 that, um, that, that recognizes gig economy workers as employees instead of independent contractors. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, the you know, Uber and Lyft and the other gig economy companies are, are pumping millions and millions of dollars into a ballot initiative for the November election that would essentially overturn the legislature on that. Um, so, so, so that's just one example, but I think that it's a, it, it, I think it's important to keep this current round of automation and the gig economy in that broader historical context. Thank you. I have uh, some more questions coming in now. Um, uh, the next one is, I wanted to ask Barry if the divergence also includes divergence in the language inside the US and Canadian labor movements. I wonder if in Canada we've gotten away from language that identifies us as workers to people that are quote unquote middle class as an example of removing the worker identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another, so again, the, the important thing here is to uh, remember the, the, the relative comparison between the US and Canada. So the whole, the, the, the rhetoric of middle, the middle class rhetoric, and the idea of Canada as a sort of relatively egalitarian, classless society uh, is something that exists. Um, you know, you go back to John Porter's vertical mosaic in the 1960s, and it's all about that, right? Um, I see Axel nodding there, so it's a, but his, he's my niche audience here. So, um, but um, so you know the the but relative to um the u.s um there is more space in the political realm and in the policy realm for recognizing and institutionalizing class division so while that rhetoric certainly exists in the popular realm the fact that you have you know a party that is tied to trade unions the fact that you have a more tripartite labor relations system just brings those things into public view, into public discussion, right? So again, you know, like I was saying earlier about hiding the boss, right? To the extent that you hide the class divisions in society, it makes it much harder to address them. And it's rel my, my argument in the book is that it's relatively easier to recognize and address those in the political and policy realms in Canada relative to the US. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question is, so you said that strikes have gone up uh, to the highest level since the 1980s, but what sectors are these strikes in uh, other than teachers? Haven't we deindustrialized over the past decades a great deal? And are these strikes in Amazon warehouses and service sectors? If that's the case, what are your thoughts on the work of Reich and Biermann on Walmart organizing, a union organizing? Is is that a promising route? Yeah. Um, thanks, Valley, for that 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 question. Um, yeah. So 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 Valley's absolutely right that that the uh, that that the strikes so far. Well, a lot of the strikes certainly in twenty eighteen and twenty nineteen are education sector, right? Um, you certainly are seeing other, uh, you know, much uh, a revival of militancy in a few other sectors, particularly healthcare. But uh, it's true that the sort of traditional union strongholds of industrial manufacturing and stuff, you have not seen this, although you know, it's important to recognize that, you know, that, that a lot of that large number in 2018 was also the GM strike, uh, which wasn't a, 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 a smashing victory necessarily, but it was the first major strike at GM in 20 some odd years. Um, you know, I think that, the uh, the that doesn't mean I think I also want to push back against the idea that 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 deindustrialization means that uh, you know that that manufacturing no longer matters. And in fact, you know, quite the contrary. I think manufacturing remains a critically important part of the U.S. economic um, structure, even if employment has dropped considerably from 
where it was, um, you know, 20, I mean, like 30 years ago. Um, and in terms of Amazon, you know, I mean, I think that there's some really interesting organizing going on um, in Amazon. Um, I think uh, there, there's another sociologist named Nantina Gonzas, uh, who just just defended her dissertation at NYU, who's done a lot of research into the organizing and the strikes um, at Amazon. Um, that uh, you know, it's 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 still way too small, and I think that that there ultimately needs to be, uh, you know, some major institutional resource commitment from major unions um, to make that actually happen. Um, and in terms of Walmart, I think like the, the problem there is that it, it's really, uh, a lot of the action has really descended into more sort of PR moves than actual worker organizing. And that's sort of a lot of what my work on sort of like the challenges of labor today is focused on, is that there's been this retreat from the workplace and sort of this you know, unwillingness to really just grapple with the importance of actually like organizing actual workers in their workplace and trying to find ways around that. And, um, and there is no, you know, as, as there is a, a famous book with this title, there are no shortcuts uh, through that you have, it, that, that labor revitalization has to go through the workplace. Thank you. I have I have a number of interesting questions left, but we only have about three minutes left. So what I'd like to do is, and sorry to those who have submitted questions late and therefore have not got, gotten the chance to, for me to read them, uh, I'd like to ask the panelists if they have any very, very brief comments in response to Barry's response to your early uh, criticisms or, or comments. We can also continue uh, down the down the list of questions that have been submitted by the audience. So if you don't have any specific answers, then I propose that I'll read one more question, and then uh, we're going to roughly be out of time. Um, does Professor Eidlin think that there is a symbiotic relationship between electoral activism and labor militancy? That's an interesting question uh, in view of what you're what you've been arguing this seems to be the case since the sanders campaigns began in 2016 in the u.s individual activists move between both spheres conversely letdowns by social democratic governments in canada since the 1990s have accompanied the decline of the labor movement and hollowing out of internal democracy in both left parties and unions what do you think of that Barry? That's a, that's a very astute observation is what I, what I say to that. Um, the, 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 this, this, this relationship between electoral activism and labor militancy is something that's really preoccupied me and all the more so over the past few years, uh, you know, as, as we've seen this sort of phenomenon in the U.S. of the Sanders campaign. As, as McKenna seems to uh, very rightly notes, I mean, generally speaking, we, we tend to think of the symbiotic relationship sort of dragging labor militancy down in a sense, um, particularly when it comes to the sort of reformist turns of social democracy. And in the US, of course, the, um, you know, the perennial attempts to realign the Democratic Party in a more progressive direction, which, uh, you know, uh, inevitably founder. Um, and, and so, so there, there's a lot of theory about the, the extent to which sort of electoralism has a dampening effect on on class struggle class conflict and sort of worker organizing because it sort of redirects it into this into this more uh, you know uh, inside politics realm and what we've seen in the recent years has really challenged that and it's challenged a lot of my assumptions to be frank about that um, in in the sense that you know with the Sanders campaign um, it's something that I, I could be wrong, maybe my, my colleagues on the panel here would, would be aware of examples I'm not thinking of, but I have not seen um, this kind of campaign where you've had a, an electoral candidate for, you know, for public office using their campaign infrastructure to actively build movements independent of their electoral campaign, right? 
So the, the Sanders campaign was actually, you know, using its campaign infrastructure, its text message, its email, all that stuff to get people out to picket lines, you know, and, 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 and so it wasn't just that Sanders was sort of drawing class lines in his rhetoric um, and, and sort of uh, raising expectations of what we can, what, what, what we should expect from government, but he was actually using his infrastructure to mobilize people. And I think that that, 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 that really speaks to this new kind of symbiosis that, that I think is, is a promising avenue. Obviously, San, Sanders is not going to be pursuing that, but um, you know, what we've seen in the U.S. recently with a sort of young crop of political leaders uh, affiliated with the Democratic Socialists of America, you know, AOC is obviously the, 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 the leading light there, but there's a whole layer that's developing, um, you know, behind her that uh, is something that I think we need to be watching carefully. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we have reached the end of our allotted time. I apologize to those of you who have asked, who've written down uh, other questions, all of which are extremely interesting. One question is, should we be hoping for, a rule, for more rule, ruling class intransigence? Because the implication, of course, in your book is that because of Mackenzie King's resistance and repression, we have a labor movement that the, that the Americans don't. Um, another one, an interesting question about the sectarianism of unionism in the United States compared to other countries, and a very interesting question about the role of the of the famous uh, 1970s um, uh, strikes by Les Gens de l'Air in, in Quebec and what role it played in Quebec uh, labor relations. Unfortunately, I, I'm just reading this out a little bit to, to, to credit the people who asked these very good questions. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have time to have Barry answer them uh, because we have now reached the end of the panel um, section of our meeting. And I am now giving over the, um, the, the floor back to Danielle. Uh, and first I want to ask, uh, thank on behalf of Barry, no doubt as well, thank Danielle and Misk and, and all of you for uh, participating in this event and organizing this event. Okay, so Barry wants to say something first, I think. And then it's Danielle. Well, actually, let me just uh, drop this into the into the chat, I will just uh, give you, this is a link in case you wanna buy the book and if you use this code, it will give you 20% off. Um, so um, a bit of self-promotion there. <laughs> You know the, those royalty checks. Uh, you know they they're really uh, they're really critical here. So we were just joking about that before the the seminar. But anyway, no, I, I really appreciate this uh, really great event, and thank you so much for those really great uh, great questions, uh, Danielle. Thank you very Danielle much. For, for... Uh, thank you very much, Barry. I mean, for writing the book in the first place, because without it, we would not have had this discussion. Very ambitious book. Uh, that's what I like so much about historical and comparative sociology is addressing these big questions and your book is really part of this important tradition and I think makes a very uh, important contribution to the literature. Uh, uh, merci à tous nos, uh, nos participants, in addition to Barry, of course, Etienne uh, Quentin, Xavier Lafrance, Shannon, Den, uh, Shannon Denon, uh, and of course, our moderator, Axel Van Denberg. I just want to tell you as the director of MISC, uh, that we have some exciting events coming up later this fall. I will just mention two that will take place in um, October. Um, so on October 14th, uh, we have a, a talk on Marshall McLuhan and the October crisis. And then that's not on our website yet, but we'll have all the information soon. On uh, October 29, we will have um, a panel, a bilingual, simultaneously translated panel on the 1995 Quebec referendum. So two events dealing with Quebec history, and we talked quite a bit about that actually uh, earlier during the discussion uh, in October at MISC, and we have other events coming up in November and of course during the winter semester. In order to find more about these events, you can visit our website. It's just mcgill slash MISC slash events. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook, or you can 
uh, actually sign up for our newsletter by email. So a lot of different possibilities for you to, to follow uh, um, up and, and to discover our forthcoming activities. So I want to thank, after thanking the audience, I want to thank our team at, at MISC, including especially Blair, who took care of the technical side of, um, of this uh, uh, panel. And I want to thank you. Merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Thank you for attending our events. And I hope that we'll see you again in the near future. Merci. Take care. And stay safe. <laughs>